Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week. Your Monday, or if you're a member of my channel, Sunday, rundown of all the latest news regarding SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy, all the launches from last week and major developments that happened, and look ahead to the next few days into all the rocket launches, advancements, and any other major events to look forward to. We'll, as usual, be breaking the video into chunks, Starship, last week's events, this week's events, and finally a rundown of the best historic spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. So, let's begin our first segment, Starship Development. Now, I'm hard-pressed to tell you exactly what I think the most exciting news surrounding Starship is this week. There have been quite a few great developments. In my view, though, I think the most, most exciting thing we heard was the publication of SpaceX's flight plan for the first orbital flight test of the Starship. So far, all we've seen are hops and high-altitude flight tests, but actually reaching orbit and then landing is a different beast entirely, and this will be the greatest test flight to watch of all the ones we've had thus far. The document doesn't confirm, or admittedly deny, whether or not the vehicle will indeed be SN20 mounted on top of BN3, which is currently believed to be the vehicle configuration that will perform this legendary flight. The flight itself will see the massive rocket lift off from Starbase, then approximately 170 seconds after liftoff, the booster will separate from the Starship, which will then perform a partial burn back to Earth before landing in the Gulf of Mexico around 20 miles off the coast, as if it were landing on a drone ship or one of SpaceX's converted oil rigs. However, in this early phase of development, this will be a soft landing in the water, much like how many of the first Falcon 9 landing attempts were in the water, and of course in similar fashion to Rocket Lab's recovery of their first Electron stage. The Starship vehicle itself will Will continue on, slicing through the air above the Florida Straits until achieving orbit. It'll then perform a powered, targeted landing approximately 62 miles off the northwest coast of Kauai, Hawaii's fourth largest island. Again, the document suggests that the landing will be a soft landing into the ocean itself, from which the vessel will presumably be recovered for post-flight examination and analysis. Whew! exciting stuff. <laughs> Watching the gigantic vehicle just launch would be an incredible event to witness, but the prospect of also watching the Leviathan Super Heavy land itself in the ocean, followed not long after by what will hopefully be the first fully successful Starship belly flop flip and landing burn from orbit, which will of course be absolutely stunning. Still, this flight is a while away, and right now there's another flight brewing it seems. Starship SN15, first fully successful full-scale vehicle to perform a high-altitude flight and landing was rolled back out to the launch pad last week. When I first heard Elon tease that the beast might be reflown, I was excited but also aware that similar claims had been made about SN5 and 6, and those never took to the skies again. However, seeing the SN15 roll back out to the pad seems to guarantee that it'll be flying again soon, or at the very least performing static fire tests. And so I wait with bated breath to see how it fares. Austin Barnard caught this great shot of the vehicle in the waning sunlight here, and perhaps the most striking thing you'll notice about Starship SN15 is how it has a sleek, hairless, aerodynamic nose cone. But this might not be the look you're striving for yourself. Fellas, let's be real. Two out of three guys would experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35, and the best way to prevent said hair loss is to do something about it while you still have that head of hair left. And yes, I'm introducing this week's sponsor right now, Keeps. With Keeps, a licensed doctor will review your information online and recommend the right hair loss treatment plan for you. After which, your hair loss prevention treatment is shipped directly to you every three months. Keeps has a motto that I can 100% stand by, prevention is key. And Keeps typically takes up to six months to start seeing results, so it's vital to act fast. The sooner you start with Keeps, the more hair you save. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and by signing up to my link, you'll ensure you retain that handsome mop of yours. So, now you've heard this wise wisdom, in order to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash lown, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash lown. But if you're a stainless steel Starship prototype ready to make a high-altitude flight test, I probably would not recommend Keeps to you. 
I am keeping all my fingers and toes crossed for a second successful SN15. Of course, if it pulls it off again, it'll be the first major milestone for demonstrating the rapid reusability of both the Starship vehicle and its Raptor engines that SpaceX are striving for. I must stress that the mere fact SN15 is at the launch site, again, is no guarantee of a second flight, but you'd think this is a pretty good omen. As for other Starship prototypes, SN16 has now been fully stacked inside the high bay, Although, how necessary the prototype will be remains to be seen, given that the SN15 seems to have fulfilled all of SpaceX's objectives prior to orbital flight, and the first planned orbital class of Starship vehicles begins with SN20. Then again, we don't really know what the internal dialogue is at SpaceX right now, and perhaps the SN16 can still provide useful data, or maybe, since it's basically flight ready, scrapping at this stage would be pointless. But as for the less complete SN17, 18 and 19, the chopping block is looking like a very real prospect, thanks to the SN15 success. Really though, the news is changing every hour at the moment it seems, so perhaps by the time you're watching this video, more information will have proliferated. Nobody other than SpaceX themselves really know what the plan is, so it's all speculation at the end of the day. And I'm going to leave my coverage of Starship at that, but the next few days will be very exciting to see, to see what happens with SN15. And with that, let's take a look at everything else that happened last week. I'd say the biggest news of last week was China's successful landing of the Zurong rover at the Utopia Planitia on Mars. This achievement on the 14th of May makes China only the second nation ever to successfully land on the Red Planet after the United States. While other agencies have made attempts, these all ended either with a crash or loss of contact soon after reaching the surface. But by all accounts, China's new six-wheeled Zurong robot seems alive and well, and it will now begin its mission to study the planet's atmosphere and surface, looking for signs of ancient life and subsurface water and ice. Initially, the mission will last 90 Martian days, but previous American rovers have shown that extended mission times are very much possible, with opportunity lasting a staggering 5,110 Martian days. Elsewhere in the space industry, OSIRIS-REx began its long voyage back to Earth on the 10th of May. This is a very exciting mission. OSIRIS-REx is a NASA asteroid study and sample return mission. Its main goal, acquire a sample from the surface of asteroid 101955 Bennu, was completed completed on the 20th of October, a feat we covered on Space This Week in fact, and now it's on its way back home. Once the spacecraft gets close to Earth, it'll deploy the sample return capsule, which will parachute down to the surface for recovery, expected on the 24th of September 2023, seven years after the mission launched. This will be the first American spacecraft to return asteroid samples to Earth, and the material returned is expected to provide scientists with valuable information about the formation and evolution of the solar system, its initial stages of planet formation, and the source of organic compounds that led to the formation of life on Earth. Bennu is able to provide these insights because it's what's known as a primitive asteroid, an asteroid that has undergone little geological change since it was formed, hence how it can sort of serve as a time capsule to the early solar system. We saw two rocket launches on the 15th of May. The first was Rocket Lab's latest mission, Running Out of Toes, which carried two Earth observation satellites for Black Sky. The other objective of this mission was first stage recovery, as part of Rocket Lab's campaign to make the Electron a partially reusable rocket, much like the Falcon 9. The launch proceeded well, but then, disaster. An anomaly occurred at second stage ignition, causing the vehicle to begin spinning out of control. We saw a very brief ignition from the engine, which was then presumably cut by the flight computers after the spin was detected, which unfortunately meant loss of the upper stage and payload. Nothing else is really known. Rocket Lab have stated that they're working with the FAA to investigate the anomaly and identify the root cause to correct the issue for future missions. Happily, the mission wasn't a total failure, as the first stage successfully deployed its parachutes and splashed down in the ocean, where at the time of me recording hasn't been recovered yet, 
but Rocket Lab's recovery crews are in the process of retrieving it. The last mission Rocket Lab recovered, Return to Sender, featured a camera in the first stage that recorded second stage separation, and if a similar camera angle is available for this flight, then that could help shed light on the anomaly that occurred, although I wouldn't be surprised if Rocket Lab kept any footage showing the ignition confidential. Time will tell, and at the very least, I hope that the recovery of the Electron's first stage can provide useful data to Rocket Lab and help pave the way to reusability. The other launch on the 15th of May was a little bit more successful, SpaceX's latest Starlink mission. This Starlink mission is a little bit different from the ones we're used to by now. Rather than launching 60 Starlink satellites, the Falcon 9 deployed just 52. That's because there were two other satellites stashed inside the rocket's fairing in addition to the Starlink payload, an Earth Observation Satellite for Capella Space and an Earth Observation CubeSat for Tyvac nanosatellite systems. The Falcon 9 first stage landed successfully on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You, bringing a successful end to this particular booster's eighth flight. Those were all the best spaceflight events that I wanted to discuss from last week, so now let's move along to what we can expect to see over the next seven days. However, I gotta shamelessly ask that if you're enjoying this video so far, then please do leave a like down below. Helps me feed my family and all that. Anyway, let's discuss this week. <laughs> The first launch of the week is today, the 17th of May, and will be an Atlas V rocket launching from Cape Canaveral. On board will be three payloads for the US Space Force. The first and primary payload is an infrared space surveillance satellite that will be placed into geosynchronous orbit, and it will serve as an early warning system for missile launches. The secondary payload is two CubeSats, which are destined for a highly elliptical Earth orbit and will be used for technology demonstration purposes. The remaining launches for the week will be in China. The first will be a Long March 4B, which will launch from the Taiwan Launch Complex. It'll carry one payload to low Earth orbit, an Earth observation satellite for the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources. The other Chinese launch this week will be on the 20th of May and will be a Long March 7. The massive rocket is already prepared for launch and on board is the Tianzhou 2, the first cargo flight to the newly established Chinese Space Station, which was launched on the 29th of April. So far, the station only consists of the core module, but this will expand as more modules are added. It's not clear if this week's cargo vessel will remain attached to the core module during the first crewed mission to the station, but it's definitely a strong possibility, given the fact that this space station has more than one docking port, as opposed to China's two previous space stations. Now, while those are all the orbital launches this week, we also have four suborbital launches to look forward to as well. I'll quickly run through these now. The first will be a Black Brand 12. A, which will launch on May the 17th from the Wallops Flight Facility, carrying a plasma science experiment payload for the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Also on the 17th will be an AGM-183 ARRW simulated glide vehicle, which will launch from a Boeing B-52 Stratofortress. This will be the first flight of the AGM-183 ARRW, we could really do with a better name there guys, and will be a test. The vehicle itself will eventually be a hypersonic missile, which will boost to a maximum speed of Mach 7 and beyond before gliding towards its target. On the 18th of May, we'll see a Black Brand 9 launch a solar observation payload for the Goddard Space Flight Center from the White Sands missile range. And then the final suborbital flight will be on the 20th of May and will be a Terrier improved Malimut sounding rocket, which will launch an ionospheric propagation experimental payload for the German Aerospace Center. And that completes my rundown of all the anticipated launches this week, so now let's move along to the show's final segment, all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. <laughs> The first anniversary of the week takes place today, on the 17th of May, when in 1969 the Soviet space probe Venera 6 began its descent into the atmosphere of Venus. During descent, the probe deployed a parachute to slow its fall speed, and for 51 minutes the capsule sent back data from the Venusian atmosphere. Operations ceased when the probe succumbed to the high temperature and pressure effects of Venus at an altitude of around 10 kilometers from the surface. The atmospheric probe's Venera 
Chimera 4, 5 and 6 provided data that would help pave the way for future surface missions, such as the Venera 7, the first probe to soft land on another planet's surface and the first to transmit data from there back to Earth. Tomorrow, on the 18th of May in 1969, Apollo 10 was launched. This was the final Apollo flight before the legendary Apollo 11, the first to place a human on the surface of the moon, and Apollo 10 was designed as an all-up dress rehearsal, going through every major motion of the moon landing, except, of course, the actual landing itself. The three astronauts, Tom Stafford, John W. Young, and Eugene Cernan, reached lunar orbit before Stafford and Cernan boarded the lunar module and piloted it to just 14.5 kilometers above the moon's surface, the anniversary of which we can celebrate later in the week on the 22nd of May. The Apollo 10's crew reached the farthest point in their orbit on the far side of the moon, and in doing so, they may well have been the furthest any human has ever traveled from the Earth's surface. Now, NASA reportedly took special precaution to ensure that Stafford and Cernan would not attempt to make the first landing, and Cernan has been quoted saying that the ascent module, the part of the vehicle that would take the lander can back to the command module, was deliberately short-fueled, such that if a moon landing were actually performed, then the vehicle wouldn't have had the fuel necessary to return to orbit. The day after tomorrow, on the 19th of May, we're back to the Venera program, this time to Venera 1 which on the 19th of May in 1961 became the first man-made object to fly past another planet when it passed by Venus. Unfortunately, the probe lost contact with Earth a month prior and as such didn't send back any data, but hey, an impressive achievement nonetheless. Also on the 19th of May, this time in 1971, the Soviet Union launched Mars 2. This was an uncrewed robotic spacecraft that was designed to deploy a small lander which would land on Mars. The spacecraft made it to the Red Planet and successfully deployed the lander, which unfortunately then failed and was subsequently lost. But despite this failure, the Mars 2 would be the first human-made object to reach the surface of Mars, another bittersweet but nonetheless major first for spaceflight for the Soviet Union. On the 21st of May in 2010, JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Company, launched Icarus, which would go on to make a Venus flyby later in the year. The Icarus spacecraft used a square solar sail measuring 20 meters across the diagonal as a means of propulsion, and during the mission it would be the first spacecraft to successfully demonstrate solar sail technology in interplanetary space. The sail contains 80 blocks of LCD panels whose reflectance can be adjusted for attitude control, a capability that was successfully tested and demonstrated in July 2010. JAXA scientists stated that the measured thrust forced by the solar radiation pressure on Icarus's sail is 1.12 millinewtons, and the spacecraft remains in orbit around the sun to this day in hibernation mode. And that's my summary of the best anniversaries relating to spacecraft that we'll be seeing this week. <laughs> Another week is done! Oh, what an exciting time this is! SN15 is raring to go on flight number two, this one of course being a little bit more scheduled than SN10's flight number two, and I'm really hoping for it to pull the second flight off, demonstrating the rapid reusability of both the vehicle and the Raptor engines that SpaceX are striving for. But it almost pales in comparison to our anticipation of the launch profile for the orbital Starship test. I guess I never quite believed we'd ever actually see the full vehicle fly. Well, actually, I guess that's not completely true, but you know what I mean. Seeing the full stack take off after it barely even feels like production on Starhopper began will certainly be an amazing sight. Maybe I'm just so accustomed to rocket development taking a long time that the unbelievable pace SpaceX are going at is a bit overwhelming for me. <laughs> anyway, on screen, on the left, you've seen it by now, it's my patrons, give a thumbs up to them. That was a great piece of ad-lib, wasn't it? They help make this show possible. If you want to join their ranks, you can do so by clicking the Patreon card on screen. You could also sign up to my channel to become a member to get these videos a little bit earlier, and you get custom emotes in the chat, and you get a badge next to your name, all that good stuff. There's also two links on screen you can click. They're like other videos on my channel if you want to check those out. And that's it. Bye!